And a good morning to every one of you. It's good to see you here today. If you were not aware of it, summer is continuing. Twilight, it's good to see you back. <clears throat> and we decided to join with you. You have to wear a mask all the time, so we were wearing our mask with you. And that, it's good to see you and your grandsons back. And they're dressed like young preacher boys. <clears throat> I'd like for you to keep your Bibles open to that passage, Psalm 22. That's a very great passage for us to consider. And what I want to do here today is basically work through (coughs) some of the main ideas, the big ideas that emerge from it. I think you're going to find it to be a very uh, encouraging uh, passage, Psalm 22. Before we do that, uh, let's go together in prayer. Our gracious God, we are grateful to you today on this Lord's Day, this first day of the week, that as we come together, we can praise you as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You sent him to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Father, we are grateful for that supreme sacrifice. And we're grateful today for that triumphant resurrection. And this very day is a reminder to us that you are the Lord of life and that you brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, our hope is in you. Our Lord, today, you know where we are. You know our situation. You know our situation individually. You know our situation as a congregation. You know our situation as a state and as a country. And Father, we come before you to say, we need you. Indeed, we need you every hour. And we need you to bring us through uh, these times. Uh, This has been going on for a long time. And our Father, we pray earnestly for all of our medical personnel, and especially those who are working on an antidote, a vaccine for this virus, We pray for all of the medical personnel as they wait on those and as they tend to those who are suffering from this virus. Indeed, from all illnesses, we thank you for them. And Father, today as we continue, we are very disturbed and very concerned because of the status of our country at this time. Lord, we want to see peace and unity. But that seems to be fading farther and farther from us. And so we ask, Lord, today for your intervention. We ask, Lord, today for those who are the leaders who have been selected by the people in the metropolitan areas, in the states, and indeed nationally. We ask, Father, that you will give them the courage to do the right thing. And we know that you are the God of order. You brought order out of chaos. You have continued to bring order out of chaos. And we know, Father, that it is not your will for a nation to be experiencing continuing chaos and violence. And so we ask that we may recognize that you, the God of order, have ordained the state, and that one of the tasks is to see that uh, that wrong is punished. And so, Father, we don't want to be vindictive today, but we do ask for your intervention. We ask now, Lord, for each person here today. Each one has his or her own load or own burden to be bearing, and we pray that you will look into the heart of each one of us. Know our hearts. And we pray, Father, right now that what you will find as you search our hearts is at this time each of us who is present has the deep desire in his or her heart to be acceptable to you, to be faithful to you, to honor you as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and as our Father. And so we pray, Father, that we may be inclined so much toward 
hearing your word. It is unto thee, O Lord, that we lift up our voice and our praise and our adoration. And we thank you for our hope. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Go back with me a little over 240 years. It is December of 1776. It is a bitterly cold winter. George Washington and his army have been run out of the state of New York. And things are looking very dismal and very dim for them at this time, the middle of December. Within two weeks' time, all of those who have come to be with him and his army will be free to go back home according to the contract that they've signed. So what's going to happen now? He's been run out of New York, and it looks like this uh, revolutionary idea is going to be coming to an end. Washington was a great leader. He called his troops together. Shoes were being worn out. Clothes were ragged. It was a ragtag army. But as he called them together in December of 1776, he said, I want you to hear something. Now, we're not very moved when we just hear somebody read something to us. But he said, I want you to hear this, something that I want to be read to you. And what he wanted to be read to them was the pamphlet that was entitled The American Crisis. The American Crisis was a pamphlet that had been penned by Thomas Paine. I should have, uh, sir, after I got to thinking about this, I should have I had a, a picture of that uh, that I could share with you today. But the very first line, very first line that was in uh, that pamphlet was, these are the times that try men's souls. And as they heard the reading of that, they determined, we'll go forward with Washington. And that night, they crossed the Delaware. You may have seen those pictures of their crossing the Delaware. And things began to go differently from there. That was then. It is now. Now. <laughs> so where are we now? Our world is faced with the coronavirus, a pandemic. As of the end of this past week, five and a quarter million people in the United States had contracted this virus, and close to 170,000 people have died. But do you remember? The first death that took place was on February the 29th of this year, less than, actually a little less than six months ago. So this is a trying time, and for a long time we couldn't meet like we are doing now. And we're, we're happy we can meet as we are now, but we long for a better time. These are the times that try men's souls. Indeed, they are. And I think each of us would testify, it has been a trying time. It is a trying time. It is a troubling time. So how do we make it through troubling times, trying times, where we are right now? We can't talk about... Uh, uh, pie in the sky, we're talking about right now, what we need to be facing. Is there a word from the Lord? That's the question today, church. Is there a word from the Lord that is appropriate to us today? Does the Lord know our struggles? Uh, does the Lord care about the struggles that we're having? Is the Lord willing to respond to the struggles that we're facing? Indeed, these are the times that try men's souls. And that's why I want you today to stay with Psalm 25, because that psalm speaks to us. It's one of the psalms in that section that belongs to David, whether he wrote it or collected it or however it was. We don't know exactly the specifics about Psalm 25, but many have thought that this may have been the result of the time of Absalom. And you remember Absalom, his own son, tried to read, lead a revolution against him. 
Whether that's so or not, it was a kind of troubling and trying time like that. There are a number of psalms in the New Testament that are called, in the Old Testament, that are called uh, uh, acrostic psalms. This is the first of those in the book of Psalms. Now, what do you mean by an acrostic psalm? Well, there were 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. As we have 26, let's suppose today that I start writing this psalm uh, in English. The first verse, the first uh, two words, two lines, would be would start with A. The next would start with B. The next would start with, you see the point, acrostic. So, the, from the beginning of the psalm, all the way through verse 22, we have the following of the Hebrew alphabet. That's not how I want you to remember about this, so that's not the important thing for us, although it is certainly interesting to see that way. You, you could recognize right away that with that it would be difficult to keep the flow of thought from one verse to the next because you have something starting with A and you want to say something, how can I do something with B? So you have some things that are intermixed in the psalm. That's why I want you to keep it before us today as we look at what is what here uh, in, in the passage. The psalm was appropriate for that time. And I'm suggesting that it is appropriate for us today as we ask this question. How are we to respond to our times? How are we to respond to times that try our souls. Now, this psalm doesn't give all the answers that we need, but it gets us started on the right track. So let's work at it together. So if I ask that question, how are we to respond? You're going to find that this psalm is one that says, above everything else, we should rely on the Lord. And it provides for us at least three very basic responses that were appropriate then, that are very appropriate right now. There are three of them that I want you to see, and they should be uh, quite evident, quite easily uh, noticed, and easy for us to remember. This psalm is stressing, first of all, Place your confidence in the Lord. Now think about that. Your confidence. Place it in the Lord. And as as he talks about placing your confidence in the Lord, beginning there in verses 1 through 3, he reminds us of three factors involved, three active verbs that are before us. How do you place your confidence in God? Number one, go. Go to the Lord in confidence. So, to you, O Lord, I will lift up my soul. That is said several times in the Psalms. It's another way of saying, Lord, I'm directing my desire to you. And further, O my God, in you I trust. Trust involves dependence. Trust involves hope. And so, this is the way the psalmist would lead us. So go. And the second active verb that involved here in our confidence is seen in verse 3. Wait. What? Wait. Wait on the Lord. None who wait on you will be ashamed. Hope in the Lord is the basis for our time. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Isaiah reminds us of that. Wait on the Lord. Have your strength renewed by waiting on the Lord. But what does it mean? Now, what's involved in waiting on the Lord? Well, let's look a little further as to what he says. For example, in verses uh, 4 and 5, he's saying what we ought to be doing now, each of us, is seeking the guidance and the instruction of God. Now, why would we say that? Notice what the prayer is. 
Make me to know your ways. The ways of the Lord are higher than our ways. Make me to know your ways. Teach me your paths. You remember, your light, your word is a light to my path. Lead me in your truth. Teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. To have our confidence in God is to seek God's word and God's will and to be faithful to it. What is it that pleases the Lord? And along with that, with waiting on him, look at how he stresses in verse 21, a little later on, that in my integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Integrity, righteousness. I will walk with integrity in my heart. How do we deal with troubled times, trying times? Be people of integrity. A person with integrity is an individual who holds firmly to his or her moral principles, does not deviate from that, committed to that. So, go to the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And one other that I want you to see that emerges out of this in regard to our confidence. Rely on the Lord. Rely confidently on the Lord. And why? Look down to verse 15. Because the Lord delivers us from trouble. My, my eyes are ever toward the Lord and look at the, the analogy, the picture that he gives us there. He will pluck my feet out of the net. Can you imagine what it is like to get caught in a net? Uh, the other day someone was showing me something on Facebook. I don't see that. It don't go there very often, but showing me that a little fawn had run across a person's yard and got caught in a net and could not get out of there. There's no way out. Finally, they, they were able to break the little fawn loose from the net. But imagine what it'd be like to be caught in a net. How are you going to get out of this? Well, he urges us in this setting to put our trust in him and to take me out of this net that they have laid for me. The Lord is the one who delivers us from the net. He delivers our feet from the net, the way the psalmist puts it. In verse 16, he says that as we rely on the Lord, we are grateful to him because he extends his grace to us. Turn to me and be gracious to me. We serve the God of grace. Now, I think it's unfortunate sometimes people think about the Old Testament. Uh, you got that God of wrath. You get to the New Testament, you got the God of grace. No, there aren't two gods in the Bible. The God of the Old Testament was the God of grace. As we mentioned uh, earlier this month, when Moses came down from the mountain and the people were worshiping a golden calf and he was ready just to wipe them off the face of the earth, the Lord responded to him, reminding him, remember, that the Lord, our God, is merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love. I want you to take that with you today. The Lord is gracious and brings us out of our distress. That's the way he puts it in verse 17. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. I think we all can be saying that at this time. So please bring me out of my distresses. I saw in uh, the uh, news that, that uh, Charles sent out last night a passage in 1 Peter 5 that I think is so appropriate then, appropriate for us now. Casting all of your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. He brings us out of our distress. And then he provides a guard over our souls. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Guard my soul. I'm reminded of how when Paul was finishing off the Philippian letter, he urged that you serve the God of peace. 
And he said literally this way, the God of peace will mount guard over your thoughts and your hearts in Christ Jesus. The Lord, a guard for our soul. Yes, place your confidence in the Lord. Let's remember that term, confidence. Go to the Lord confidently. Wait on the Lord with confidence. Rely on the Lord with confidence. But as you move more into the psalm, there's another thought that is stressed, not as much on this next one as in the one that we've just seen, but they're very vital, very important. This psalm urges us to confess, to recognize our own sinfulness, and be willing to acknowledge our sins before God. We're creatures who find it so easy to blame someone else for what my problems are, my wrongs are. He made me do it. You remember Flip Wilson years ago we used to make uh, say something to that effect. The devil made me do it. No, we have the ability to come before God and acknowledge our sins. And that's what David does, especially in Psalm 51. But here in, in this passage, he urges that we sincerely confess our sins before the Lord. The same thing that John has urged. If we confess our sins, listen now, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If I try to make excuses, I try to hide from them. I don't have any assurance of forgiveness, but I acknowledge my sins. And so in this psalm, the psalmist urges us to confess our sins. And remember that God has been and is the God of forgiveness. In, in this psalm, the, the psalmist, be it David or whoever it was, looks back over the long history of Israel up to this point, And he urges those who sing together in this psalm, Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. It has been shown over and over again. So, he is in the, looking to the history of God's dealing with his people. He is the God of mercy. So today, remember this as we confront our sins. Remember, we serve a God who is faithful and who is merciful. And then there is the plea to show mercy to me in my sins. Remember not the sins of my youth. I think all of us can look back to our youth and see stupid things that we did and see things that if we could run by that again, we wouldn't do it. Remember not the sins of my youth, but according to your steadfast love, remember me. Now, that's the assurance that we have. When Jeremiah was speaking of a new covenant that God would make, And the writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament shows that has become a reality. Here's what is stressed. Their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Now, today, if we bring our sins to the Lord, He'll forgive. And they are forgotten. I will remember them no more. That's the God whom we serve. Along with that, he urges in verse 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it's great. If every one of us really look at ourselves, not looking at someone else, looking at ourselves, we see, yes, there are things, certainly many things that I need to correct, and I need to be forgiven. But God forgives. Pardon my sin and my guilt. The prophet Isaiah says that if we will turn to the Lord, the Lord will abundantly pardon. Now keep that before us today. These are the times that try men's soul. But the God whom we serve says that if we will rely on Him and acknowledge our dependence upon Him, and thank Him for His goodness, that our sins will be remembered no more, however great they may be. 
confidence. He stresses that. Confession of our sins. Times that try men's souls, confidence in the Lord, recognizing our own sin. But we're not in this by ourselves. I'm not the only one here. I'm glad you're here. I'm not the only one. You're not the only one. And do you notice how this psalm ends? It's amazing. All of a sudden, in verse 22, he says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. He begins to think of others. Thinking of the whole nation of Israel. That's the same attitude that Paul had in regard to the gospel. I I bear witness concerning Israel that they have a zeal for God. is not according to knowledge. But he, he says, my prayer to God is that they might be saved. And so, in this time, we need to be thinking of others as well. So we pray for others. He was praying for his fellow Israelites. Are we praying for one another? Are we praying for our family members? Are we praying for our nation? Are we praying for the progress of the church? Pray for one another. One other thought that I want to share with you on this. This psalm also says that as we have a concern for others, we go and tell others. We tell others about the Lord. What kind of Lord is he? He's good. He's upright, we're told in verse 8. He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Tell others about the Lord. Tell them about his steadfast love. Tell them about his atoning work for our sins. Tell them about our hope of eternal life. Tell others. And along with that, as we tell others, tell others of the spiritual benefits. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Listen, he will instruct him in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in his well-being. His offspring will inherit the land. But then this is the thought I want to share with you. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. The friendship of the Lord. Isn't that great? The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear. And the word fear there has the idea of reverence for God. These are the times that try men's souls. These are the times in which there is the need for a reverence for God. So, what are we saying today then? We're saying that we should respond positively positively to the challenge that's before us. It may be the Lord's opening up doors to us that we cannot even imagine right now. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. It could be. But we must be prepared. We must be ready. We must be uh, of the nature that He can mold us and make us for His purposes and His will. I think it's appropriate to look at what Hosea says right there in the middle of his book as he is addressing the northern nation of Israel. How does it go? First of all, he said, let us return to the Lord. In the times that try men's souls, this is the time to return to the Lord. He's torn us that he may heal us. Now you think about that. We've been torn that we might be healed. He has struck us down that he might bind us up. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. For he will come to us as the showers, as the springing rains that water the earth. This psalm is so relevant for us. These are the times that try men's souls. But how do we respond? We respond in confidence in our Lord. 
We confess our sins. We lay them out before him. And we show our concern for others. For others. For you. Today, as we plan to sing this hymn of invitation, we're singing it that you might be thinking about your own need, your own life. Are you in the Lord? Are you His? Are you in that covenant relationship with Him? This is the time to make things right before God. Whatever the need may be, to become a a child of God, be born into the kingdom, born again of water and birth, or whatever other need there might be, you're invited while together we stand and sing.